Hey everybody, it's your pal Boney, and it's time for lunch therapy. What's going on here? What's happening? Hey, it's time for lunch therapy, and that was my my friend Boney. Uh, we had a little bit of an introduction um, thing happening. That's kind of fun. Um, we are here live streaming from Koreatown in Los Angeles, and uh, I got my Christmas shirt on. Don't stop believing. Can't stop believing. I don't know. I don't know what we're believing in. But whatever you got to believe in, do it. Because it's time. I've got my my New York Yankees beanie on today in solidarity for the people there in New York City. You know, I put this thing on my head sometimes just to kind of keep keep my head together, keep it from exploding. And I've, I felt that way for a long time um, that I like to, you know, sometimes put something on my head uh, just to, just to keep it together. My, my dad, I remember when I was younger, he used to, when he had this particular hat on, he had a, it was a, some kind of welder's hat. It was made out of quilting. It was black. And when he put that thing on, you knew to get out of his way <laughs> because he was going to, he was going to be doing some stuff. And I don't know whether, you know, he was going to be cleaning the gutters. He was going to be raking the leaves. He was, he was just going to be going to town, going to town. And if you were like lazing about, laying on the couch or doing something leisurely, it wasn't going to go over well. So I learned to look for that hat uh, and, uh, you know, get ready. So today I'm wearing the hat because, uh, you know, I woke up. I, I was having a little bit of the quarantine blues. I think it's a thing. I think quarantine blues is happening. Um, a lot of us are, you know, we've been hunkering down for a while. In the beginning, it was sort of, sort of fun, sort of novel, sort of a different, different way of living. You know, maybe some of the pressure was off. But as it goes, you know, you start to like uh, go, is this going to happen again for another day? And how many, how long is this going to happen? And people are asking each other, how long is this going to happen? And then uh, we don't, nobody knows really. Nobody knows. That's that's one of the weird things about it. So, so we got to hunker, hunker up. My buddy Neil Phillip texted me and said, uh, you know, can you hunker up? And I'm thinking you can, and I'm thinking that you kind of have to, right? You have to start hunkering up. So I'm going to be making a big effort to to be up, to be aware, to be present, to be happy, I guess. Happy is a good thing. If we can all be happy through this, it's a, it's another part of the job. Happy and healthy. They always go together, happy and healthy. So we're going to take a deep breath because it's lunch therapy. <sighs> That's what we do is we take a, a deep breath. We hold it for a couple of seconds and then we let it out. So we're going to do it one more time. I know it helps me. You know, I I need it because the live streaming is not happening. Starting to build an audience, but I'm not able to live stream, so I can't have the audience interaction, which is just makes it super fun. And you know, I got on the thing with the Spectrum yesterday. I finally called them up and was like, "Hey, maybe you can send me a new modem and I can just install that." We used to always, you know, back in the day, we were, we, when we were in high school, there was this guy named John, and one day, we were in like a computer class with our Texas Instruments computers, and this is back in a time when people call, you know, they coined the phrase computers, which back then, that was kind of what they did, is they just did computations. So it wasn't a lot of, it wasn't super fun. There was no internet. There was none of that stuff. And, um, but we were, you know, we were like interested in computers. Wow, how does this work? Maybe I can make a, 
a pixel go across the screen. What is a pixel? I don't know. Maybe I could make a Pong game, you know, with the little paddles and things going back and forth. Well, John was way ahead of his time, I'll tell you that. He, one day the teacher said, you know, there's a thing called a modem and it allows you to communicate over phone lines to other people with your computer. And you know, John stood up instantly and said, I'm going to get myself a modem. And we, I mean, we thought that was hilarious. We just, oh my God, we were just laughing so, we were laughing so hard for days afterwards. We were saying, I'm going to get myself a modem. Just, you know, out of nowhere, we just say that. That became like our catchphrase. I'm going to get myself a modem. I mean, and the thing is, he said it as if he was from the South or something. He wasn't. He was from Seattle, Washington, Edmonds, Washington. He said, I'm going to get myself a modem. And for years after that, we would say that. You know, you'd call up your friend. You'd be like, hey, I'm going to get myself a modem. Turns out, John was incredibly prescient. Little did we know, everyone in the world would want a modem in the future. And the modem was, was a huge, huge revolution. And to us at the time, it was just a joke. It was a joke for many, many years, many, many years until, you know, when we were older and we came up with the phrase again, we'd be like, I'm going to get myself a modem. Like we remembered it. We're like, oh, wow, we do all have modems and they're very important. My modem, however, is letting me down, totally letting me down. Um, I mean, it's not totally letting me down. I can, I can put this show up. If it was totally letting me down, I wouldn't even be able to put this on. I wouldn't be able to do anything. So hopefully this new one will allow me to do some live streaming, some interactions, some take some, take some suggestions from the audience, and that'll get me out of my doldrums. This whole background thing, not really a big deal. You know, everybody's doing Zoom conferencing these days. We had a supper club meeting, a bunch of us guys that went to college together. We got together and uh, all of us in our separate little boxes on the Zoom conferencing. I think that it's time to... Uh, not that. Not That's not the Zoom. Uh-uh. This is the new Zoo Review. Um, not zoom at all. Um, but anyway, it's time to zoom, 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 ah, uh, zoom. Come on, baby, zoom, ah, uh, zoom. Come on, give it a try. We did this before. Um, anyway, we're doing the zoom. Everybody's doing it. Backgrounds are in that thing, so it's not really like magic. And besides, my green screen is horrible today because of the don't stop believing shirt. So let's just get out of the cell. Let's get out of the, let's hunker up. Let's get, get back to the clean world. And, uh, you know, there's some things things that I've been thinking about. Oh, I wanted to mention, too, Jimmy Shin's not going to be on the show today. I hyped that up yesterday, but he is going to be on the show maybe Saturday. Tomorrow we're going to record an interview. It's going to be an interview with Jimmy. Jimmy is a, is a comedian. He's from... Tacoma, Washington, and spent a lot of time in Seattle, Washington. He is my friend, and he is a big supporter of live comedy and a big supporter of me. And so I'm going to get him on here, see how he's been coping, because, you know, it's tough when you're a live comedy promoter and a live comedian that's, you know, worked, he's been working for six years at least on his comedy to get it to the point where he can go around to these different clubs and do an hour an hour of comedy, and I'm talking comedy, not not comedy, but funny, funny stuff. And he keeps the audience really engaged for for an hour. He and I went up to the um, Harvey's Comedy Club in in Portland, Oregon, and that was really it was really the second road show that I did. The first one I went up to Tacoma, Washington, the Tacoma Comedy Club, and that was. So much fun because all my buddies from college and all my friends from uh, high school all 
took the trek out to Tacoma and we, uh, we got in there and, and we just had a blast. Super fun. One, one of my friends, Rob Thal, he had so much fun that he was out until like three o'clock in the morning. And when he went back to his room, there was some dude in his bed. <laughs> they had double booked his room. And so Rob comes in there <clears throat> somewhat inebriated, I think gets into bed and there's some, some Filipino dude in there just in bed with him. And the guy, the other guy jumps out. He's like, what are you doing? And Rob's like, I don't know. And it was like that scene from planes, trains, and automobiles where, you know, where's your hand? It's between two pillows. What two pillows? John Candy, Steve Martin. Yeah. So they, you know, freaked out both of them, Rob Thal and the guy, the other Filipino guy, that's the way he described him. He, uh, they freaked out and then the front desk told him, Hey, we'll give you a free breakfast. That's all they gave him was a free breakfast. They didn't say we're going to comp your room. They gave him another room. Um, but still a free breakfast. Come on. So then Rob then goes out to his car after his free breakfast and the car's window is broken and his laptop is gone and he has a parking ticket. Unbelievable. Tacoma, Washington, ladies and gentlemen. So I called up the front desk and I said, you know, my friend, he had the, all this stuff. His car got broken into, his computer got stolen, he got a ticket and there was a dude in his room when he came home and they, he, all he gave him was a free breakfast. And they said, I'm touching my face again. I can't help it. I'm not going anywhere. Anyway, they said, you know what? Costs extra to have a dude in your room. He owes us. No, they didn't say that. They gave him a free room. They gave him a free room. But it's hardly, you know, not too much compensation for all the hell that he went through. But he came out to see my show, which was the coolest thing. And, and anyway, we had fun regardless. Um, so then Jimmy took me up to Portland. And I was the featured performer. And just before the show, he said, Joel, you know, since your parents are coming tomorrow, maybe you should be the the host and I don't <laughs> I don't I didn't really know I mean I'm you know I'm a I'm a comedian but I haven't been on the road a lot so I don't quite know how it goes I don't know what a host is I, I don't know what featured means I know headliner is the guy that likes up there for like an hour so I'm like cool yeah I'll host and uh you know he would, had said hey they're gonna love your uh serial killer routine and you know like they did in Tacoma and stuff. So I was just ready. I got up there. But instead of hosting, because I'm just used to doing, uh, you know, my bits. I went up there and just did my bit. And I come in and I pretend that I'm Australian. And I do this whole thing about being Australian. And it's really good to be here. And Americans, they, they're not so free. And I did that. And then I do this whole bit about Seattle serial killers. And, uh, you know, I go through all the serial killers in Seattle because it's fun. I mean, it's fun. It's just there. It's serial killers from the seventies and eighties and stuff. And it's, it's not fun. I mean, serial killing is not fun, right? It's not terrible, terrible thing, but, uh, you know, comedy is dark. Comedy is, uh, not pretty as Steve Martin so wonderfully put it, uh, yeah. So I did that and, you know, it went over okay, but they were like, where what's happening because in the comedy club they they introduce they get it all the 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 host has to come in and get everybody all psyched up has to come in we got a really great show for you we got jimmy shin here today we got you know and you got to just be like really happy and uh I was doing the Australian thing and just being a weirdo and then talking about like acting in California, which nobody cares about in Portland, Washington, I mean, Portland, Portland, Oregon. 
And uh, so afterwards, Jimmy's like in the green room and there are these dudes standing there with him. And I knew something was up. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So I, I, I knew something was wrong. And uh, Jimmy looked like he was like in the principal's office or something. And these dudes are talking to him and big tall guys. And I was scared. I was, and I, I kind of instantly, because I'm insecure, I thought this is about me. This is about me. And you know what? I was right. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, hey, what's, you know, what's happening here? Because I want to just, you know, get to it. And uh, he was like, I'll, I'll talk to you in a minute. I mean, he's really cool about it. And he went and he ha had to sell his t-shirts because that's what you do when you're on the road. You sell t-shirts. Uh, I'll wear his t-shirt uh, maybe next time. It's super good. Um, but anyway, Jimmy's out there selling t-shirts and he said to me, you know, they didn't, they didn't like your serial killer routine. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they said, uh, no, no. He said, no. Um, apparently they're ex cops, both these guys who bought this club, like months before they bought the comedy club and revived it. They apparently were cops. Yeah. And they were chasing down one of the serial killers that I mentioned at some point in their careers, and it was really horrible. And uh, they were they were just decided that no one would like that. And I mean, they wouldn't. So I, I went up to one of them and I was like, "Hey, I'm both of them." And I was like, "Hey, I'm Joel. You know, I heard you didn't like the serial killer stuff, but you know, I got plenty more material." And uh, they were like, "Yeah, you gotta. We don't like that. People don't like that." And so. And for me, you know, it kind of was the whole centerpiece of my whole, <laughs> whole act. So I mean, it was just dismantled, completely dismantled. And uh, they said, you know, you need to tell jokes about Portland. And you need to tell jokes about the Portland Trailblazers and things like that, that Portland people are going to like. And this is a big lesson for me. Big lesson is comedy is different everywhere you go. And you know, you gotta find a way to get connect with your audience. And they, you know, however, whatever, by hook or by crook, you have to do this. So we had five, five more shows that weekend and my parents were coming. And now I was gonna be the host every night because Jimmy like, he was like, no, you got to, this guy's a good, really, you know, funny comedian. And he came all the way up here and, and you got to give this guy a chance. Cause they just wanted to fire me right there. And, you know, to, uh, to Jimmy's Testament, he could have just gotten another person from Tacoma cause he knows a bunch of comedians in Tacoma and he could have just gotten one of them to come and fill my place. And that would have been the end of it for me, but no, he hung in there with me. And um, I hosted for the rest of the weekend, and I even, I wrote some Portland jokes. I mean, I was just walk around Portland all day. I hadn't spent a lot of time in Portland. I've been there a couple times. Um, and certainly I know the Northwest sort of tood, I guess <laughs> you'd call it. Um, and I saw a lot of episodes of Portlandia where they, you know, had made a whole uh, series about Portland jokes. So I walked around and I just kind of soaked in as much Portland as I could. And then I would go on at night and talk on the stage and it got, it got better and better and better and better. And I learned a lot and I, you know, it made me braver, it made me a heck of a lot braver because when you, you know, sometimes there's a freedom in almost getting fired. There's a kind of a freedom in it. I, I don't recommend it to everybody. But, you know, if you really hang with it, because my first impulse was like, well, I'm going to tell my parents not to come to the show. I'm out of here. Screw those guys. They don't like my jokes. I'm going to take it. I went the other way. I went the other way. First of all, I felt like, you know, Jimmy was counting on me. I also felt like, like I'm counting on me, right? Like, how am I going to get back on that horse? It's just like, when I was in uh, high school, I was on the swim team, as many of you know, uh, because I've talked about it ad infinitum, about being on the swim team. But 
I was on the swim team in high school, and there was this guy, Eric Spencer, who was an incredible diver. And he was doing kind of Olympic caliber diving in, on this crappy swim team from Woodway High School. And, I mean, we were not good. <laughs> I mean, there were some good swimmers on there, but in general, we were, we were really not, we didn't really win a lot of meets. Let's just say that. So Eric Spencer is there doing these crazy flipping things and then landing in the water with no splash. I mean, this guy was like, he ended up competing with Greg Luganis. He was that good. And he would just be over there diving while we're like, you know, flopping around in the water trying to make a team. And, and he would just hit these things. And one day... He goes up in the air, does this crazy thing, and bang! Hits, the, hits his face on the front of the board. And we all, you could hear it from throughout the, the entire swimming pool area. You could hear that smash. And then the slap when he hit the water. And then there was just blood. And we go, I go over there, I'm like, ah! Oh. And Eric gets out of the pool, and he's bleeding. And he wipes the blood off his face. And he gets back up on the board. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I got to get back on that board. Or I'm never going to get back on that board. To this day, one of the bravest people that I ever met. And this guy got a lot of the flack in, in high school. I mean, he got a lot of flack because he was, he was so good that his letter that he had and uh, on his letterman's jacket just full of metal. He had medals on there because he had won the state champions. And his sister would get on because he was very, he wasn't going to blow his own horn. He wasn't going to tell anybody about it. And, you know, people didn't go to the swim meets, so nobody really knew. This guy, Eric Spencer, was so damn good. Um, his sister would get on the intercom and talk about him, you know, in the announcements in the morning because somebody had to. Because the other guy, people were making fun of him because he had all these medals on his uh, letterman's jacket. No one had medals. We didn't have medals. He did. Oh, and the, I'm going to get myself a modem guy. His name was John Gould, by the way. I just remembered his last name, and um, I want to give him credit for the incredible prescience that he had about modems and how we're going to get... And I, you know, to, even today, I'm like, Spectrum, I got to get myself a modem. But the whole point of the Eric Spencer story is he inspired me to get back up on that stage in Harvey's in Portland and just with my parents in the audience and just work it out. And I, I went to brunch with my parents that morning and I, um, you know, I really got to hand it to them because... You know, we've had rocky times here. Uh, you know how it is when you're with your parents just throughout. We had great, we've had great times, and then we've had other times that were just really difficult. And uh, they came to support me and came to Portland. And, you know, sometimes it's scary to see your son up there on stage doing something that is just possibly going to go very wrong. <laughs> And so they, I mean, they gritted it out. They came down there to Portland. They got themselves a hotel room. I went to brunch with them that day, and I was debating on whether I was going to tell them about the kind of angst that was going on, the kind of that I almost got fired. Essentially, I was debating about whether I was just going to pretend like nothing happened, and I didn't, of course, because my mom. You know, you see your mom, you're just like, <laughs> they almost fired me. So I had breakfast with them. I told them all about it. I was, you know, got a little teary sometimes. And, uh, you know, they, they were scared. <laughs> uh, but the cool thing about it is one of the cool things that happened that morning was my dad, my dad's a, uh, an artist, a metalsmith. And I had this friend when I was growing up. Uh, his name's uh, Matt Wright. And he was in the band Gas Huffer, which is a huge underground band during the, like, I'm going to call it the grunge era. 
Um, I don't think Gas Huffer would enjoy that moniker, but the um, he's just an awesome dude. And uh, but his dad, Matt's dad, was a um, is a poet. He was a doctor, and now he's a poet, and he writes poetry. And he wrote a poem about my dad. Matt's dad wrote a poem about my dad, and they're you know they're both artists. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to find that poem. I'm going to read it on here at some point. Um, I, I texted my mom about it, uh, to see if I could get it. It's a beautiful poem. Anyway, I read that poem, hung out with my parents, and then I just walked all over Portland, just all over Portland. And, uh, I just learning about Portland, like how can I connect with these people? And I just kept writing jokes. And I, you know what? I even got on YouTube. After calling every comedian friend that I know, uh, especially the professional ones, and just telling them the story and them saying, yeah, <laughs> that's going to happen, man. That's going to happen to you again. And you just got to suck it up because that's comedy. That's the comedy world for you. You got to just suck it up. So after doing that, I was like, I'm going to suck it up even more. I'm going to watch some YouTube videos about how to host a comedy show. And I found out hosting a comedy show is a different animal than coming up and pretending you're from Australia and then talking about being an actor in Hollywood. You got to get into these people and find out about them. And also, you know, the other thing that the host does is the host will look in the audience, see what's going on. So when the other comedians come up, the, the featured and the headliner, they know, oh, there's a bachelor party in the audience. They know that that dude with the hat is heckling. You know that, that you know, they kind of, it's kind of you, you find out what's going on. And you also find out, you know, who's married, who's single, who's, who's everything you can find out while you're up there. And also there's weird business like, hey, we're going to have a raffle at the end. Anyway, I really, you know, I learned something there, there in Portland, Portland, Oregon. And I'll just say this. I, I went into a card shop there. And, you know, in, in Hollywood, they say you could um, die from encouragement. And I think they're saying that because there's so many, so many artists out here, so many actors out here that we all know that it's, you know, you need encouragement to do what you're doing every day to get out there and, you know, put your butt on the line like that. Uh, and also, you know, people say all kinds of crazy stuff because it's sort of seems like you're just like me, 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 me. And I'm just so, you know, let's talk about me. And there's so many jokes about that and stuff. So there's this saying in Hollywood, you can die from encouragement because the other artists are like, I love you, man. I love your work. And you won't know, really, until you get put it out there on the internet and you get some terrible comments or something like that. But I walk into this, this store, in, the card shop in Portland, Oregon, and there is a card that says, don't give up on your stupid little dreams. <laughs> and I think that that, I don't know. I mean, that's, I love it. I love it somehow. I'm not saying that that's Portland for you. Portland, you know, Portland's got so many different aspects. Did you know that there are apparently great strip clubs in Portland? Who knew, right? Who knew? Who would even think that that would be true? Um, but, you know, and I, I, it's not surprising, I guess. And, um, you know, when I was in Portland also, I saw some kids. They had a, they were like college kids. And they had a big bottle of syrup <clears throat> and they were just pouring it on the ground and all of them were looking standing around while the guy poured the bottle of syrup on the ground to this day I have no idea wh what was happening there but that you know that's Portland for you weird stuff it's a weird it's a weird fun rainy place and uh I just want to shout out to Cole Aikman and Cheryl Aikman who live up there and uh, took me in that same day when things were, were a little crazy. <laughs> and 
and also were there for me. And, and, uh, it's just, you know, I appreciate what you guys did. Um, so tomorrow or the next day, we're going to have Jimmy Shin on here. We, we can talk about his career. I'm going to be doing some interviews. Sometimes it's going to be serious, you know, sometimes it won't be as ridiculous, I think, because you don't want to find out about these people. Um, also, Fat Free Film is starting up again. The podcast, Fat Free Film, it's, it's all audio. It's on the podcast. We did it, you know, back in the 2000s, in the middle, like around 2005 to 2007, we did Fat Free Film, and we had all kinds of people on there, like Peter Bogdanovich and Thomas Jane and Patricia Arquette and just all kinds of people, um, Stuart Stern, and we interviewed them about filmmaking. It was kind of a filmmaking school for me. Since then, I've gone and made some films. Uh, one of them is Equal Means Equal. I produced that with my wife, Kamala, and, you know, so that was my film school, and so we're starting it up again, weirdly enough, and we are going to have our first interview on Friday, and we're going to get that thing up there probably probably on Monday, the, the next episode. I think it's episode 81. So that should be fun. We got that to look forward to. We got Jimmy Shin to look forward to. Um, there's also, um, there's going to be a thing dropping on Saturday. My, my friend Tom Kearney, who was on the show, he uh, is doing quarantine comedy where he's reaching out to, uh, to different comedians in the, in the community and just doing some wacky skits. And uh, I'm going to be on the one uh, a week from now. There you go. So thanks for joining me in Laugh Therapy. I'm going to try and get this, this stream happening in a uh, more um, live fashion. I got some comments from my buds here in the, uh, my personal chat room, which is my cell phone. Um, and I'm going to use those in the future. Let me just take a look and see what they're saying. Um, one of my friends is hoarding mayo. That seems like a really weird thing to hoard. But, you know, the thing about Gordy is he um, he can talk you into anything. He is a, um, a master of talking you into anything. I'm sure he talked his wife into hoarding mayo because he just really likes it and is concerned that they're not going to have any. And, uh, you know, one time he talked me into... Um, drinking, um, you drinking out of a vacuum cleaner hose. There, I said it. I said I drank a some something out of a vacuum cleaner hose. I survived. Th those were different times where we had much better immune systems, I guess. Uh, uh, I won't even get into that. We'll get into that some other time. That's for another day. But today, this is a laugh therapy. I'm going to have some. A place where you can subscribe if you're not already subscribed and then some other places where you'll see some other videos to watch and thank you very much this has been lunch therapy <laughs>